Hey everybody, I'm RJ Kerr, and today I want to do something a little bit different. I want to talk about the transformation that occurs between writing an adventure and actually running it. And to do that, I'm going to do a comparison walkthrough between uh, an adventure that I've created here on the channel and then expanded afterward. Uh, you might recall The Haunted Moor, which I created in a previous video. And this was kind of a down and dirty adventure that we created as a, you need something right now for the game tonight. And you've got like an hour, hour and a half to create it. And so we built that out very rapidly. And what we got was a series of events that could occur during the session, which in many cases is a wonderful foundation for what we're going to run. But there's still a little bit of alchemy that happens between this page of graph paper and notes and what we actually put down on the table, something more along the lines of this. And that difference is story. And so I want to talk about how you take an outline adventure, something that's just sparse notes and build a story out of it. And a lot of that has to do with choices and the choices that you make prior to outlining this for your players prior to uh, sitting down and explaining the situation to them and uh, pulling the NPCs into your from your imagination into the world and a lot to do with the choices that you present your characters with because what you present to them is going to be ultimately what they choose from and that's going to change the narrative that's going to create the story as it evolves. So I want to talk about all of that today. I want to do a walkthrough of uh, the Haunting of Scalens Moor as an example of that and to kind of hone in on where those differences are. But first and foremost, I want to let you know that in sort of the spirit of doing a deep dive into this, I am offering uh, free copies of the Haunting of Scalens Moor. Uh, there's a link in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the video description below. Uh, where you can click on that, get your free copy, uh, and that you know sale on copies will run through the end of the weekend. So it'll end on uh, Monday, the 23rd of September, 2024, if you're watching this in real time. It'll still be available for purchase after that, but if you want a free copy, jump on in and grab it. So take a minute, pause the video, get your free copy, open it up so you can follow along. Okay, so let's take a look at what we started with. And I'm sorry, we're gonna have a vertical orientation here because that's just the only way to fit this in the split screen mode here. Um, but this quickie down and dirty adventure, like I mentioned, is a series of events. It's, it's interaction points, it's scenes that could occur and likely will occur over the course of the adventure. And that's really what you're that's the bare bones of what you need. The minimum of what you need is these little interaction points, which I'm gonna call scenes going forward because that's how I like to think of them. They're moments in time that the characters will interact with in real time. And then periods where not much is going on, you kind of time skip over those, those periods um, or you summarize them. Like for example, travel, we summarize into a couple of dice rolls maybe or a random encounter or something like that. And so uh, really we're telling these stories in a series of scenes, a series of vignettes. So we have uh, sort of the, the foundation of those scenes from this outline, but what we don't have is a lot of choice. At least we don't have a lot of explicit choice. And choice is what makes the difference between a, well, a, frankly, between a monologue and a story, right? Player choice and indeed GM choices are what takes something that's kind of static like this and turns it into something dynamic as a story. So let's take a look at sort of the fleshed out version of this. What I built from that to create uh, a, a, an easily playable um, sort of, you know, full kit, read and ready kind of adventure. And so 
first off, let's let's talk about what it's about. Because what we get for the outline isn't really what it's about. We have a skeleton that we can adapt and twist and change to fit whatever we want the story to be about. And what it's about is the first choice that you are making as a GM, right? You're deciding what this story, you know, what what's the objective of the story? What is the foundation of it? Not necessarily what's gonna happen in it, but what is it that draws the characters into the story and what ultimately will be the climactic question? Because the climax of, of any adventure is the answer to a question. Will the player succeed or will they not in their chosen objective? You get some influence in that. You get more influence in that than you think. So what I did when I took this, took this outline is I sat down and I started by coming up with background. What did I want this adventure to be about? Well, I wanted it to be kind of spooky. I wanted it to be kind of haunting. And so I came up with two adventure hooks, which are effectively just two adventure objectives. And they aren't mutually exclusive, so we could use both of them or we could use one or the other. The first one was to kind of end this haunting, to cleanse the land, if you will, uh, and oust the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the undead entity that we had set up for ourselves as the big bad of this uh, adventure um, over here in our moor, or over here in our, our barrow. Uh, inside our moor. And the other one was ancient treasures, right? Because one that's always fun, it's an easy motivator for characters, but to go and find something that's important, that has been lost to time inside this long forgotten barrow. And so starting out with that, I needed some history. And so I started off with a villain who is haunting the moor. And I created a background where we have this uh, this long dead warlord by the name of Vorn Bryn Scalen, who was a tyrant and was murdered. Uh, and his oath sworn bannermen tried to have him resurrected and it kind of backfired on them. And they all ended up undead, bound to this land, with Scalen being impervious to damage so long as his urn exists. And so immediately with this little bit of background story that, that I've come up with, I now have what the adventure is about, and I have something to lay out for our characters to interact with. So that's the first choice that you get to make as a GM when you're taking something like an outline like this and converting it over into something that you're actually gonna put down on the table and run. You're starting with that initial decision. What is the story about? And from that, you are suggesting goals. Now, ultimately, your players are going to choose their own goals. They can decide they want to do something other than, you know, cleanse the land or find ancient treasures. But you are laying out for them what is the implied goal of this adventure and what is the likely one that they're going to choose. Because if you lay out some objectives for them, they're more than likely going to say, oh, I want objective A or objective B instead of I want objective Z. And you don't need a whole lot of different choices to lay out for them in the beginning. Two or three is plenty because frankly, there is no difference between no choice and infinite choice. They're the same thing. They're just as paralyzing to your players. They're just as frustrating. But two or three choices gives them something meaningful to choose from without overwhelming them. So next I want to talk about setting because setting is one of the major decisions that you as the GM are gonna make early on before this adventure ever reaches the table. Now, we did a lot of the heavy lifting for ourselves already in our outline, where we outlined some of the uh, thematic notes that we can use for descriptive elements as we narrate travel from point A to point B. We also spent some time working on that map, meaning that we already know that this is gonna be a point crawl style adventure where the uh, characters are moving from discrete location to discrete location. And we spent a good amount of time working on developing meaningful navigational choices, creating loops, 
and giving places where the characters have lots of options for where they want to go and making it so that the choice between left or right is a significant one that depending on which one they choose will greatly affect what the players and what the characters experience. And we add to that by building out not just the thematic elements uh, and talking about things like terrain and lighting and the atmosphere. And by that, I don't just mean like the air, but I also mean sort of the ambiance, you know, the noises uh, that exist or don't exist in this sort of place. But, the, but also the elements of setting that the characters are going to interact with. And that includes things like navigation and foraging, but it also includes random encounters and hazards. Because the things that the characters run into are going to help set the stage of the sort of experience they're having, and that will influence the choices that they make throughout. Now, it's not going to make choices for them necessarily, not if we've done it correctly, right? But uh, it is going to nudge them in one direction or the other. You know, for example, a inner, you know, an interaction between a vampire or an interaction between a bunch of banjo playing werewolves uh, is going to suggest different outcomes to the characters right away. It's going to influence the sorts of decisions that they make. And so what we choose for things like random encounters really make a difference. Um, and so they don't have to be elements that are necessarily directly related to the more formal encounters that we have, the other scenes that we've already created throughout this adventure, um, but they are more of an atmospheric element, right? Because, for example, there may be no reason in any one of the scenes that the characters might encounter wolves, but wolves on the moor set a different tone than, say, frogmen on the moor, right? Likewise, some of the things we put in random encounters can be natural hazards. Like, for example, peat bogs, I should say, uh, moors are famous for their peat bogs, uh, especially when you, you know, read books about, like, uh, like The Hound of the Baskervilles or what have you, uh, by Sherlock, the Sherlock Holmes story uh, that take place inside moors. You know, we hear stories about things getting stuck in the peat bogs and it's like quicksand and it starts sucking you down. And that's a unique feature that helps sort of set the atmosphere. It doesn't necessarily have to be super hazardous depending on what, uh, you know, when and where the characters experience it, but getting even temporarily, you know, mired down in a peat bog really helps create a place that feels real and vibrant where decisions and their and, and choices matter. Likewise, making it so that not every random encounter is necessarily a fight is another part of that. And so, for example, you know, one of the things that I added from the original outline was uh, a quick set of roles that you can do to determine the attitude of the creatures that the characters encounter randomly. Because, you know, having it always, having them always be hostile or always be friend, be friendly uh, sets, well, it limits the choices that the characters have to make in a very subtle way. Because if they encounter a creature that is hostile, that means that a fight is like 90% of the time going to happen, right? And likewise, for a creature that's friendly, you know, most of the time that's going to end up being a social encounter. The vast majority of the time it's going to end up being a social encounter but they, they encounter a creature that is perhaps suspicious or indifferent or cautious, that leaves the question open-ended. Which way will the encounter go? Positive or negative? A fight or a conversation? Or will they just choose to ignore each other and pass on by? And that gives your characters decisions that they can make on every level, making these encounters far more meaningful and having them actually build out the story as opposed to just being static elements within it. So setting is a big part of the choices that we make when we take an adventure from uh, conception on the paper to the actual uh, playing of it. So the next bit to talk about are creating places where the characters have choices to make. Now we've already set up many of our scenes where we have set up places where we think a fight is going to happen 
We know that there's going to be the boss encounter or perhaps a social encounter, that sort of thing. But these uh, in our original outline are very flat, right? Because again, a fight is one thing. There's no choice there. You know, a social encounter is one thing. There's less choice there. There are fewer meaningful decisions other than, you know, do I swing my sword or do I cast a spell? Do I uh, try to persuade or deceive? And those are decisions, but they're not nearly as meaningful choices as will this be a fight in the first place? Or will it be a negotiation? Will this be a social encounter? Or will it be a stealth mission? You know, uh, and so one of the things that I did and that I do is start adding layers to these events. You know, so for example, I went in and we had come up with the Hermit Grogwin in our original design as a social encounter and a possible ally whose uh, hermitage is hidden out here in the moor and the characters have to find it. And that's a cool little thing to discover. But what I did is I also gave Grogwin things that he wants. Specifically, he's out of reading material, giving him something that maybe he would want from the characters that they could use as leverage. And they could use that to help create sort of sort of guide the choices that they're going to make. They have something that they can use in a social encounter and uh, that they might be able to barter with him with. Uh, they have, perhaps, if I want to take things in a different direction, once we're, depending on how the situation's going during the game, I have something that he might try to, maybe he'll, maybe he might try to lure the characters uh, into a false insecurity and like steal their, you know, steal the wizard's spell book or something like that. All that kind of stuff. So we gave him a want which makes him a more interesting character and gives our players something to work with. Now that's kind of a low level way of adding choice here, right? That's like almost the most basic level that you can do. And so to deepen that, I looked to the supposed fight that we had outlined with this war band of, depending on the party level, newt folk or bullywug or lizard folk. I, I expanded it out so that it was easy to scale depending on the party level. Um, just something I like to do with adventures like this because you never know quite where they're going to fit into the campaign. So that's kind of a, a side note. Um, and so I took what was originally our design set to be a good old fashioned brawl and turned it into a situation that very could easily become hostile. However, uh, starts off with this warband has a purpose. I call them the Quag Drake clan. And they're here to effectively kidnap Grogwin. You know, their chief has decided that they want the sage Grogwin to come serve their tribe. And so they're out here looking for them. And so we again add different layers. You know, we've now created two factions that are in opposition because clearly Grogwin doesn't want to be kidnapped. Uh, and the Quag Drake clan doesn't care that he doesn't want to be kidnapped, but they can't find him. And so now we have a more pervasive, uh, a more even more significant set of choices that the characters can make. Which faction do they side with? Who do they help or do they help neither one of them and therefore receive benefits from neither one of them? And so by creating these even like tiny little factions where you know, in one case, it's one person. It's Grogwin who's on one of those factions. Uh, we, again, create meaningful choices for the characters to make above and beyond just their, whether or not they're going to, uh, you know, defeat Scalin and his undead, who, again, are a third faction in this case. And I even worked a, uh, a sneaky fourth faction uh, into the random encounters in the form of an awakened raven. Uh, just as a fun little thing for you as the GM to, to play around with. So building those factions into the game and giving every NPC that's in here a want, something that they that, that is their objective for this adventure, helps create places where meaningful decisions become organic for the characters 
It gives them things right away to choose from. Do I side with Grogwin? Do I sign with the Quag Wake? With the with the Quag Drake clan? I can already tell that's gonna be hard to say during a campaign. Oh well. Uh during the Quag Drake clan. Uh or do I side with neither of them and kind of go my own way? So again, now we're at a place where we're not making decisions as the GM. We're laying out really laying out roads for the players to choose from. So of course, choices within the game are only meaningful if they have stakes, and that requires challenges, things that the characters uh, need to overcome in order to achieve their objectives. Choices are great, uh, and they are going to really shape the, well, they're gonna shape the story. They're gonna make this feel like something that the characters are creating on their own, although, you know, you're certainly as the GM adding a, a big old scoop of creativity to that, to what they're building. Um, but it's giving them uh, a world that they can craft and interact with in a way that feels meaningful to them. But, you know, even a choice of a meaningful choice of A or B that the answer is always, yep, that's what you get, uh, becomes less exciting unless there is the risk of failure. And so with that, we want to layer in challenges. And we've done a lot of that in the outline um, in terms of, you know, creating situations that could become combat, uh, creating things that are trickier combats. For example, we have uh, this ravine in here that's full of this peat, patches of peat bog and it's got the skeletons in it. Um, and we worked that in to this adventure uh, in the, the form of the sunken marsh. Um, where, you know, we have the bridge across and we've got the peat bog hazards and we've got, you know, skeletons and shadows or what have you uh, that can threaten the characters and really create this, this sense of risk. But there's more that we can do to that. And one thing that we hinted at in the original design that we didn't really spend a lot of time building out was this idea of Scalin's phylactery, right? His invulnerability uh, without the solution to, uh, to his puzzle. That puzzle being that as long as the urn exists, he can't be damaged. And so we hinted at that. We kind of had that idea, but we really didn't do anything with it in the outline, which makes sense for the time crunch that we were on and knowing that we could kind of invent some of that stuff and let it sprinkle throughout the adventure. But when between actually creating this and running it, you know, I layered in a lot more to this. And as we've been scrolling through this, you might've noticed that we've come to sections that had clues. And so that's what I did. I took, I created three clues uh, where the answer was, you must destroy, effectively, you must destroy Scalin's urn or else he's invulnerable. And I sprinkled them in three separate places throughout the adventure to really layer in some of that stakes so that now we create a situation where yeah, the characters 100% could blaze their way through and just go from, you know, area one all the way up to area 12, where we have our confrontation with uh, Scalin and never really engage with the rest of the point crawl. But if they get there and they don't know the solution to the puzzle, well, they can't defeat him. And now he knows they're after him. And so again, we have a meaningful decision to blaze forward, to not spend any time exploring and learning what we can ahead of time and ending up in a situation that's more dire than it would have been otherwise. And so, you know, puzzles are one of those things that a lot of GMs and players shy away from because there's this concern that the players have to be as smart as their characters to figure them out, or have to be as good at puzzles as their characters to figure them out, or have to be as intuitive or as logical or, or, or whatever, right? But the fact of the matter is that you as the GM can give as much information as you want. And so you can layer in clues and things that hint at secrets that the characters need to discover um, and give them that information you know, from the result of a check, right? So for example, in this, 
uh, with the standing stones. We have, you know, that uh, any creature examines the standing stones can make a DC 12 wisdom perception or intelligence investigation check. And on a success, they notice a series of images and we just give them what those images mean. We describe what they are. Uh, and then we talk about that they all refer to Scalin's curse and that they're effectively talking about the need to destroy the urn or his invulnerability while he's while that urn exists. And so we've created a puzzle on this that isn't necessarily hard. They don't have to find all three clues to figure out the solution. They really just have to understand one clue to figure it out. And the three are in there just for redundancy so that it's a lot harder to miss them. They're more likely to encounter one of those clues uh, and learn that information, uh, you know, and not end up in a situation where they've kind of blazed through and now they're in a tight spot because they can't defeat Scalin and Scalin's after them. Although that creates an interesting situation too, because now they know they have to go back and figure out what they missed previously. So again, layering in some of those challenges that span the entire adventure and kind of building up those layers creates these interesting choices uh, for the characters. And that idea of building up layers to create these meaningful choices uh, pervades every part of this adventure, right? Because it doesn't just come down to the overarching adventure itself, even when we get into for example, the final confrontation with Scalin, we have this little mini dungeon, right? Where we, again, we have choices, meaningful choices. We can go straight through and go through the trapped uh, corridor or look around for hidden meaning, right? Or uh, hidden secrets, I should say, and have this safer access point. You know, we build in the possibility that Scalin and his crew might be surprised if characters come through the secret doors because it's been so long they've forgotten that those exist in there. And so, again, we're just creating, we're going in to our original design and adding things that weren't there originally that create these meaningful choices, places where the characters can make decisions that affect the rest of the adventure, even in, in just little ways. And that really is the crux of the difference between our outline and the finished adventure. At the end of the day, that really is just the only thing that changes between drafting it and running it. It's layering in places where characters can make choices and layering in your own choices as the GM. So thank you so much for joining me today. If you have enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, hit that bell icon so that you never miss a video. If you haven't downloaded your free copy of The Haunting of Scalin's Moor, please do so. Uh, it's gonna be on, it's gonna be free only for a limited number of days. So get your copy while you can. After that, it'll be a full purchase item. And then last but not least, if you are interested in running this adventure and perhaps you'd like to play it through before you run it for yourself, come check me out on startplaying.games slash GM slash RJ Kerr. I run this one with some regularity uh, and it's a relatively short campaign. It's, it's about three sessions or so to run uh, in the two, two and a half hour time blocks that I do on, uh, on that site. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining me today and I will see you next time.